Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is uh, Tony Cully Foster. I have the honor of being the President and CEO of the Wor World Affairs Council DC. As you can hear from my speech impediment, I'm Irish and proud of it. All right. And the Irish know a little bit about the topic we're going to discuss tonight because we've been exemplars in terms of being reasonable, being uh, open to negotiation, being willing to bite the bullet, willing to make a sacrifice for austerity. But of course, that's in our DNA. We've been doing that for a long time, all right? We're very fortunate tonight to have three distinguished people here with us. And I'm going to uh, start by introducing John Greenwald. John is a member of the International Affairs Committee of the World Affairs Council and a partner at Cassidy, Levitt and Kent, where he has an international practice with particular emphasis on international trade matters. All of you are good readers, therefore I'm not going to read all this stuff off to you. If you're not a good reader, you may leave the room now. <laughs> uh, John uh, is going to give some background on the situation, uh, following a, a little bit of background from me. Uh, he is an international trade lawyer with significant experience for many, many years in dealing with European matters and, of course, with <coughs> other global issues involving trade. We are very fortunate to have Professor Theodore Kariotis as a professor of uh, economics for the University System of Maryland, someone who has served in the Greek government, a friend of someone called Papadreas, <coughs> And he has also taught at George Mason University and George Washington University. He is a specialist on the economic ramifications of our subject matter here tonight. And we are delighted to have Professor Kariotis here with us tonight. And then we come to the lone female on this panel, outnumbered two to one, but she can handle it. She's got a very impressive resume, Dr. Constantine. Last name, Zelson Mueller. Uh, in the inaugural is the inaugural Robert Bosch Senior Fellow with the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution. Expert on German, European, and transatlantic foreign and security policy and strategy. Prior to working at Brookings, Senior Transatlantic Fellow with the German Marshall Fund of the United States, where she directed the influential Transatlantic Trans Survey Program. Areas of expertise include transatlantic defense policy, German foreign policy, NATO, the European Union's foreign security and defense policy. Wide range of publications, everything from the FT to the International New York Times. Just some brief talking points. Greece's central problem, as far as I'm concerned, is that it has too much debt and too little economic growth to service that debt. The Greeks can't generate growth without spending more or taxing less, which would only intensify the central issue that they're facing, an enormous amount of debt. Sixty-one percent of Greeks voted last Sunday against the austerity plan that would also provide Greek, Greece with some debt relief in the form of cash payments to the Greek central banks. The banks, as you know, if you've been watching television or monitoring the media, are rapidly running out of euros. We'll address that later. Greek Prime Minister and his far-left Syriza party are determined to protect government spending and resist economic reform. They hope that Sunday's no vote will scare creditors into agreeing. The danger is that if the Prime Minister succeeds, Voters elsewhere in Europe will conclude that there's no reason to accept difficult economic reforms if creditors capitulate. 
Finland has commitments to Greece of over 5 billion euros. Its annual budget, 50 billion. Our GDP, its GDP, 200 billion. If you look at percentages, 10% of their budgets committed one way or another to Greece, said the Finnish finance minister. Thomas Piketty, a popular inequality econo ec economist, argues that the debt was created by older Greeks forging the books. Allowing Greece to enter the European Union on false claims. However, it's important to forgive debt because it will not fall in that generation. It will fall in Greece's future generations to, to, uh, to come who share no guilt in Greece's current financial woes. The precedent of German debt forgiveness. The factors surrounding the German debt relief in 53 in London were far different from those facing Greece today. After Germany was split in two by the World War II allies, 10 million refugees from the Soviet-controlled eastern part of the country, about as many people as there are in Greece now, flooded the West, creating a humanitarian catastrophe of major proportions. The majority of German debt, written off in 53, was from the Treaty of Versailles which aimed to hamper Germany's ever emerging as a, as a European power, which ultimately led to the rise of Nazi leadership. Greece will use the debt relief to provide free electricity to households, subsidize rents, restore Christmas bonuses to pensioners, raise minimum salaries, that is to return to the practices that led to the accumulation of Greece's debt. It's an extreme case of moral hazard, which the post-war German governments have conscientiously avoided. Final words, what would gre Grexit mean for the EU? Some economists, such as the former Greek finance minister, Stephanos Manos, believe that a Grexit would provide countries and political parties an example of what policies to avoid tightening the relationship between the eight remaining 18 EU countries. Others, such as Vicky Price, former joint head of the United Kingdom's Government Economic Service, <coughs> argue that the Grexit will, at its very least, create an atmosphere of uncertainty that will stunt growth for years. End of the sermon. John, over to you. Um, thank you. I was going to start off by first complimenting the uh, World Fair Council professional <coughs> staff for picking this topic uh, and then organizing this as quickly um, as they have. Uh, they deserve high marks. You couldn't ask for something that is more immediate than the whole issue surrounding um, uh, Greece, Greek debt relief, whether they stay in the euro or not. I was going to illustrate this by describing my morning, which was to go out and get the three newspapers, um, see headlines on uh, uh, the Greek um, financial crisis in the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, and the Wall Street Journal. And then each one of them gave their editorial advice to all parties, which I'm sure um, was much appreciated. Having listened to Tony um, give his introduction, it sounded remarkably similar to the editorial that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, for better or for worse. Let me give you some background on the crisis and then um, go through this very quickly and turn it over to the experts. The story begins in uh, Greece's entry into the Eurozone in 2001. The Euro, Euro became the currency in 2002. There is an important difference, which is sort of lost, not, not uh, by design, but it just gets lost in the discussion of this between membership in the European Union and membership in the Eurozone. There are major European Union members, Great right? Britain, Sweden, Poland, Czech Republic, that are not in the Euro and they are full-fledged members, nevertheless, of the European Union. 
the Eurozone is a group of the remaining, most of the remaining countries that have that sort of embarked on an experiment of a single currency and the economic and political advantages, benefits, that were supposed to flow from that. Greece became a member at the beginning, but frankly, in order to qualify, there seems to be little doubt that Greece cooked its own books. In order to be part of uh, the Eurozone, there was a target of a 3% um, budgetary deficit, government budget deficit, 3% of GDP. Greece presented papers saying they were either there or close there too, but in fact, um, they apparently were quite a distance from it. Participation by Greece in the Eurozone worked really well for the first five years. If you look at the numbers, Greece's GDP, uh, gross domestic product, between 2002 and 2007 grew at an average annual rate of 4%. Um, the Obama administration would be delighted if it could run on that record. The problems began when the global recession uh, hit. Things went very bad, very quickly. In order to give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem now, over the past seven years, Greece's GDP has fallen by over 25%. That is far greater than anything we experienced in the Great Recession. The national debt has risen to 177% of its GDP, and in the unemployment rate, I believe is about 26%. So Greece is going through something that is much closer to what we went through in the Great Depression than anything anybody in uh, really in North America has witnessed since. Much of the decline in the Greek economy has occurred under policies of austerity imposed on Greece by its creditors, led by Germany, but along with the IMF and the European Central Bank. So the question is, where do things stand now? The latest chapter in the financial crisis um, comes about when Syriza party comes to power. This is in January of this year, so it's all very recent. And they come to power on an explicit anti-austerity platform, but also with a pledge to remain in the euro. That requires accommodation with your bankers. The negotiations with the creditors for new funding have not gone well. Syriza is looking for a relaxation of some of the austerity measures plus some debt forgiveness. And I don't really um, claim to know the, 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 the details, but it, I think that the debt forgiveness has been a major sticking point as have some of the requests that um, uh, uh, the creditor countries and institutions ease up on um, the restrictions on uh, government uh, spending. <coughs> the negotiations failed. The Greek prime minister decided, I think, um, was, uh, um, I don't know if it was considered or it was just a function of a uh, you know, spur of the moment thing, but decided on a referendum, yes or no, up or down, on the bailout terms offered by uh, the creditor countries and institutions. And the government itself argued for a no vote. The government won. 61% of Greeks voted no. So what happens now? Um, if you sort of uh, followed the news throughout the day, Greece has changed its finance minister. The former one, I think, was viewed um, uh, unfavorably by people who were given to dark troops, uh, suits and pinstripes. Um, they have a new one that appears more casual, but apparently nothing much has changed, because as I understand it, there's no new proposal given on the part of Greece, at least not in right written form. And Germany's public pronouncements on the matter have been less than encouraging. So before I turn it over to the experts, and then I hope some dialogue with the audience, why does all this matter? I mean, why do we really care about what happens? The fact of the matter is, 
the impact of Greece's exit from the euro on the Greek economy is likely to be very severe indeed. But the impact on the European economy and the impact on the world economy is likely to be minor. So if I were just sort of giving my view of it, the reason we care is not the economic downside to the rest of the world from the failure of the, um, uh, to resolve the financial crisis. But there are other aspects to this that are, that are terribly important. One is that Greece is something of a canary in the coal mine. I don't know if you all know that miners used to take the canaries down into coal mines, and if the canary died, it was time to get up because oxygen supplies were dwindling. Well, Greece is a bit of the canary in a coal mine for other European countries that are struggling with austerity. Can they resist successfully um, a German Northern European IMF axis? We'll see. And then if Greece is, leaves the euro is, or is forced out of the euro, what happens? There seems to be very little doubt that the immediate impact will be chaos for the Greek economy. But you can't just make decisions based on what you think the immediate impact is going to be. The deeper question is, what if, as was the case with Iceland, the country the economy stabilizes, and then five years out, turns out it prospers. What lesson does Portugal, what lesson does Spain, what lesson uh, does Italy um, draw from a successful departure from the Eurozone? And finally, there are the political implications. When I talk to Europeans and ask them to justify the economics of the Euro, the conversation immediately turns to a justification of the politics. It was this drive to create a tighter knit, more cohesive um, European political unit. And one of the questions for both panelists uh, today is, has that worked as intended, or is it in fact creating deeper divisions? And if Greece can leave the euro and ultimately be better for it, what does this say about the future of the euro and even the future of the EU? So with that as a sort of introduction, we have two distinguished panelists, um, Dr. Theodore Karyotis from the University of Maryland and Dr. Constanza Selsen-Muller from the Robert Bosch, uh, or the Robert Bosch Fellow at the Brookings. Institution. I'm going to turn it now over to Dr. Kuriatis. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Of course, uh, today it's a nice <coughs> break for me because I feel these tragic moments are taking place in my birthplace. Uh, in fact, my students used to call me a cool professor, but I'm not cool at all today. I'm an Athenian, and my ancestors, 2,500 years ago, invented almost everything. <laughs> you see how typical Greek I am. But in my opinion, the two most important words were logic and tragedy. Today, the tragedy is still around, but the logic is missing. You find out in my presentation that uh, I'm more harsh on the Greek side than the European side, but this would not have happened if I knew a German lady would be sitting next to me. <laughs> Ancient Greeks had two words for the people, the demos of democracy and the laos of the mob. With his call to shift the burden of his own errors and his reluctance to reform onto the soldiers of Greece's fellow Europeans, Prime Minister Tsipras is leaning towards the latter manifestation and promoting the worst version of Greek politics. It is important to note the parliamentary alliance of Tsipras with the conspiracy-minded right-wing independent Greeks, whose leader do not only shy away from diatribes against homosexuals, Buddhists, Jews, and Muslims. It is also important to note the fact that Tsipras did not refrain when assembling parliamentary support for his referendum, 
from soliciting the support of the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn Party, whose help any other European leader would have rejected. Uh, yes, the, the beginning, when I said about the ancient Greeks, it was someone who wrote about it, and I quoted him earlier. He also said, none of this means that we should write off Greece's EU membership. In other times, the Greeks paid dearly for the no to the Nazis and to the no to the military dictatorship. Nothing would be sadder than to see them also have to pay for last Sunday's no, a farcical simulation of those earlier noble acts of defiance. Many Eurozone leaders have the forbearance to recognize the flawed no that has been delivered and to be more Greek than the Greeks. May they act in a way that prevents Greece from ever having to face the true tragic meaning of Sunday's vote. As someone else recently said, democracy becomes a matter of referendum only in exceptional circumstances when elected leaders run out of ideas, when they have lost the confidence of the electorate, or when they usually approaches have ceased to work. Was that the case for in Greece? Was the position of Prime Minister Alex Tsipras so weak that he had no better choice than to pass the buck to his people by resorting to the extraordinary form of democracy that is democracy by referendum? What would have happened if Greece partners, each time they confronted a decision that they lacked the courage to make, broke off discussions and demanded a week to allow the people to decide? Greece got hastily arranged referendum. He got an opaque, indeed a downright incomprehensible referendum question. He got no public information campaign worthy of the name. It got an appeal for a no vote that no one understood. The details of the proposals that Greek voters were supposed to reject were not even disclosed to them. Greece. Um, the previous speakers also mentioned it has suffered and will continue to suffer. Its unemployment rate is over 27 percent. The gross domestic product has fallen by a quarter since 2008. What the past several years have shown is that suffering and austerity did nothing to help Greece or its creditors. And no more moralizing and punishment at this point will change that reality. As a recent New York Times editorial said, from an economic perspective, it is clear that Europe's leaders, it is clear what Europe's leaders should do. They need to restructure <coughs> Greece's total debt of 317 billion euros, about 177% of its GDP. They keep the country a member of the European Union and NATO in the Eurozone. The famous Troika, by demanding that the country cut spending and raise taxes, has depressed a weak economy and drove up unemployment, making growth and increased revenues impossible. Of course, we need to point out that the previous two Greek governments worsened the situation by not implementing many reforms that they had agreed in the first two memoranda. Unfortunately, if the new Greek government signs a new memorandum, it will continue the policies of the previous governments and they will not implement many of the policies that they would have just signed. <coughs> of course, Greek officials, past and present, are responsible for many of the country's problems. But European leaders have made the crisis worse by their mismanagement. Now it's incumbent on them to end the threat to the Eurozone by saving a small, paralyzed country. In the last two decades, the new economic picture of Greece slowly emerged. A spectacle of inefficiency and outmoded structure show their ugly ha uh, head. The oversized public sector, indicative of resource waste, stands as a true representative of an economy in bad shape, far behind in international competitiveness, and suggests the large difficulties Greece will face in exiting from its troubles. Turning around the country, which for years fed by greed, indulged in exhibitionist consumption, 
instead of economic modernization, created an atmosphere in which endemic corruption was encouraged as a method of self-preservation. In a harsh globalized, globalized market, corruption is a new norm substituted necessarily as the mother of inventions. Some people knew only that they could vote yes and either abstain or vote no as the, at the last minute. Many on opposite sides wanted the same thing, the thing the great majority of Greeks have wanted from the start, a livable future inside the Eurozone. Their disagreement was about how best to get there. So now we have made the leap and through that mysterious moment of democratic transformation, we enter a different world. Maybe this no will turn out to be a yes to a different Europe. Maybe that will come, but too late for Greece. Thank you so much. All right. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, I found that very moving. Um, where do I start? If I may, I will do something uh, unusual and uh, something I don't usually do and follow you, though, and s talk about my own feelings about this. Uh, you use the microphone, please. I'm sorry, it's, if this isn't, is this not working? It should be closer. Better if I pull it yeah. this way? Okay. Um, sorry, I was going to say that I, I think I will talk, uh, that I will start out by, by saying something that I don't usually do, which is talk about my own feelings about this. Um, I've just spent the past month in Europe. Uh, in fact, I came back on uh, just a week ago. And I was in Sweden, in Greece, in Poland, and in Germany in between. Um, so I think I can, I can give you not just a sense of attitudes and opinions in my own country, both from people who are, um, I, you would consider, sort of policy-making circles, uh, but also my own friends and the sort of general German public. And I can also tell you what I was told by Northern Europeans and by Eastern Europeans and indeed by Greeks. Uh, and I, of course, can tell you my own view. Um, and let me start with that just to make my position clear. Uh, I am not, I'm not of the party in Germany, which does exist, which says that it is only for the Greeks to move on this one. I disagree with that. Um, I do, however, agree with Professor Kariotis, um, and I think that is where he and I were probably, you know, converge. That uh, this, there is, there, given the anger, the distrust, and the, the, the feeling of humiliation, I think on all sides here, and not just not just in Greece, but in other countries in Europe, which have undergone similar privations and similar programs and have strong feelings about all this. Um, I think given all that, the only way we can achieve a viable compromise is by each side making concessions that are excruciatingly painful to them. Uh, that means, I think, the Greeks getting to work at home and, and doing the reforms that they, I think, need to do in order for people not to have to pay to even get access to a doctor's waiting room. Um, to me, that's, that's, to know that that was even the case is, is I think, is, and that this is, was possible in Europe is, is deeply distressing. I think, you know, you, as you, my idea of a decent society is not one in which you have to pay to even see a doctor. Um, that is, I think, inherently wrong and has to change. Um, the question is, can we help change that uh, rather than, you know, uh, dictate how it's done. And I think what, where I see the mistake of the EU, the IMF, and indeed the German government uh, is in thinking for the, really since the beginning of the, of the crisis and since the first haircut uh, to the institutional creditors in 2010, that um, these stringent prescriptions for structural reform that have indeed worked in other countries, in the Baltic countries, in Romania, uh, in Ireland and Portugal and Spain and Italy to some degree, 
would work in a country w whose political economy appears to be so deeply dysfunctional. And I think the failure in the rest of Europe and in the IMF was to read the, that economy and that and Greece's societal, the signals from Greece's society accurately, and then to react flexibly and appropriately. Um, and I feel, I have to say, I, I find that very saddening. Um, and I think this is the time when all of us move towards each other. Um, let me say why I, uh, another thing uh, about how I feel, and this is, I, I feel that I have been on edge about this, and uh, the German expression is nachts senkrechte Bettstein, standing upright in my bed at night uh, about this for the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight weeks. Um, it's been an emotional roller coaster. And for anybody who cares about the future of Greece and the future of Europe, uh, I think it can't be otherwise. And I know from many of my German friends, who are policy experts, belong to this community, that while we have been worrying and got, you know, losing sleep over Ukraine uh, and over Russia and over uh, migrants drowning in the Mediterranean, we've also been losing sleep over this. The problem is, if you are sitting in Berlin, that, um, and if you are at, the, at a desk in the foreign ministry, in the defense ministry, or in the chancery, um, Greece is one of the many things thundering across your desk um, from morning to night. I recently heard a German state secretary in one of, the, one of the key ministries saying with a sigh, and he was looking very gray as he said it, I sometimes think I'm running a Ukraine ministry. Yeah. And indeed, my policymaker friends, uh, I haven't seen them this gray and this, uh, this anxious looking in, in, in quite a while. Um, and so it's, it's the Swedish foreign minister, former free Swedish foreign minister Carl Bildt, recently said that Europe was increasingly surrounded by a ring of fire. And I think that's true. Uh, I think that is of deep concern to all Europeans. It is certainly of concern for Berlin, and it ought to be of concern for, for, for the Americans. Because if we fail to address this challenge appropriately and successfully, you lose your best partner in the West. In fact, you lose a significant part of the West which is why I'm for saving Greece, I'm for keeping it in the Eurozone, I'm for keeping it in the EU, and I'm for doing what it takes. But I don't think that's going to happen if the Greeks don't make a decision like the Latvians, Lithu Lithuanians, the Romanians, the Portuguese, and the, Ar the Irish, and many others did, to say, okay, we're gonna buckle down and do this. Yeah. Again, it, but it does take concessions from both sides. Um, as a security expert, um, I the thought of a Greece uh, leaving the Eurozone, becoming vulnerable to pressure from Turkey, from Russia, and from China is tremendously worrisome to me. Uh, it's a nightmarish proposition. I can see all sorts of nasty things happening there. The uh, southern flank of, the Europe is, uh, of Europe is, is very vulnerable to uh, all sorts of pressures, uh, migration, terrorism, the use of pipelines for um, uh, extortion and bullying. Um, there are all sorts of things cooking there for which we need a strong Greece, which is a good and successful partner in Europe and in NATO. Um, I will say one last point about, about the, the German conundrum here, which I think I've hinted that, but I've, I will spell it out if I may. And that is that I'm 53 years old. I was born in the year the wall went up, and I was 27 when the wall went down. Uh, I was studying at Harvard. And uh, this was a miracle which changed my entire life and changed the Europe that I would come back to. And I think that I can speak for many in my generation in Germany <laughs> when I say that this is a Europe that we are willing to fight for. We grew into a Europe that was saved by the Americans, that was saved by the Allies, and saved by the generations of our parents who were children in World War II. Um, and rebuilt and made into something of a union of unequal prosperity, safety, stability, and democracy, and freedom. Um, we inherited it, and my generation, I think, at least when I was a student, it is fair to say my generation thought that we weren't going to have to do much to manage that inheritance. And that is what the generation of our parents told us. They really told us, it's all perfect. You're not going to have to change much. We've, done, we've set it all up for you. You're inheriting a trust fund. So don't squander it, but the trust fund will be there forever. Well, guess what? It didn't 
you stay that way, it's not there. And we're having to re we're having to redesign and reinvent Europe in ways that my generation couldn't possibly have imagined. But I can tell you from what I know from not just my my generation in Berlin, but elsewhere in Europe, is that I think that there is an entire generation there that is determined to do just that. And we are determined to do it with the Greeks and not without the Greeks. So all I can say is I hope we figure this out. We haven't got a lot of time, but this is the time to do it. Thank you. Uh, let, let me carry on um, the dialogue by asking um, you a question where the answers, I think, were implied but not explicit. And that is, had you been a Greek, what would your vote have been in the referendum? And well, if, one of us is a Greek. Why well, are you asking me? I'm as, I suppose <laughs> I as a Greek. Yes, you're quite right. I stand corrected. <laughs> Um, how would you vote in the referendum? And if the answer is that you would have accepted the bailout terms that the Greeks rejected, why do you think the next five years would be any different than the preceding five, which have been horrendous in terms of economic development? And if you would have voted um, uh, against the bailout, as the Greeks did, would it have been to seek um, concessions to improve your negotiating leverage, or would you have been doing it with an eye towards leaving the euro? Professor. Uh, as you said, I'm the Greek one. You are the Greek one. Uh, I would have voted for no. Sorry, I would have voted for yes. Uh, <laughs> the reason, <laughs> the reason uh, for that, of course, is that uh, I was worrying that the no uh, will take us out of the euro. Uh, of course, uh, this is a terrible thing that would happen. Many people worry that uh, it will take us out of the European Union, but that su such a scenario does not exist. And the, as I said on my presentation, the referendum it was a paranoid one. Basically, it says you vote no for this uh, bad, terrible uh, memorandum, or you vote yes for another terrible memorandum that will be less terrible than the one that they have offered us. And uh, I was also worrying that the no part, uh, it would have been because a large part of the no were people that really wanted to take us out of the euro, go to the old drachma, and that would have been terrible. It could still happen outside of the uh, memorandum. And uh, uh, it is difficult, of course, now to predict the future. As you said that earlier, we know the latest uh, uh, Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras, instead of calling Putin five months later, decided to call President Obama. President Obama, apparently, the Greek sources said that he told him that uh, uh, you should try to remain, of course, in the, the Euro area. And the, the Euro group today took place. The new uh, Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Tsakalotos, uh, went there, and he had no uh, proposal to make. He put some points there. They were upset with that. Then the summit started, or before the summit, Mr. Tsipras, uh, Mr. Hollande, Juncker, and Merkel had the meeting, the four of them. And then the, the summit took place. And uh, nothing happened with that. They came out. After that, the European leaders, I had no time to hear the Greek prime minister. I don't know if he ever talked. I had to come here. Uh, they said that uh, the Greeks have to bring a solid proposal on Saturday on the Eurogroup. And then the, the leaders will have a meeting on Sunday. And this should uh, resolve the, the issue. The, the, another proposal the Greeks have made, of course, they said, let's make a mini short-run memorandum 
and let's talk so we can get some money because of the capital controls that exist now that they have lines on the ATM machines and let's talk about the bigger picture of the memorandum later on and this apparently was rejected. Um, you know, I'm not sure that I see much point in in walking over the grave of this uh, of this question. I, I really think we've. The, I think the you know I wrote my doctoral thesis on direct democracy in the United States for whatever it's worth, and and I think that you know this was the worst possible way of asking a referendum question and of holding a referendum. I think that's pretty much a given. Um, and I think um, we, are, we are now in a new zone. Um, and what's required now um, has to, I mean, both the decision and the implementation has to happen in a time frame that is so short as to make it all almost impossible. You know, this is going to require an inhuman effort on the basis of all concerned. You know, so I think going back over, over over who did what to whom at what time, I think is... At this, no, the is, question is, really is, was, how, would you have voted yes or no, and why? But how, how can I presume, as a German, to put myself in the position of a Greek voter? I'm sorry, I, I think that that would be both condescending and presumptuous, and I'm not going to do that. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> and, and so I'm not going there, thank you. Um, but what I, what I would like to say is that I... I, I, and I, you know, we, we have to have a conversation where it's not the rest of Europe telling the Greeks what to do, but where the Greeks are put into, the, into a position with short-term help um, to make decisions about how they want to self-organize. Yeah. It seems to me from all my conversations that I had during a, a half week in Athens with economists and other people and with Greek friends afterwards, that um, a lot of people are thinking about this the same way you do. They feel both humiliated and shamed by the rest of Europe, but they also feel humiliated and shamed by their own politicians and their own, and their own oligarchs. And I think that um, we have to have a conversation where, where we uh, you know, acknowledge that we've all made mistakes and where we, where we have an honest discussion about what, what is doable. I mean, I, I, am, I am convinced personally that this isn't, it isn't possible to do this without some kind of a haircut. Um, it may be necessary to not call it a haircut. In other words, to extend debt maturities into you know, the far blue yonder, which frankly has already happened to a great degree. The debt maturities were never really Greece's problem. The, the, the problem is that you have, just as, as we had in, in some of the new Eastern European economies after they joined the EU, uh, you have state structures and societal structures that have limited absorption capabilities for help, and including for financial helps. And so what you have to help with here is institu institutional reform, but this is the first time that we are looking at doing it in Western European, or in a country that is you know, considered the cradle of Europe, and that is, by, by most Europeans, and certainly by Germans' definition, an old European country rather than a new one. Yeah. Um, this is the conundrum here. Let me, let me try and, and get at this from, from a slightly different way. Um, and which is that you, you were saying, you were talking about the cooking of the books. You know, everybody in Europe cooked their books. And let's not forget the Germans broke the rules as well when they undercut the Maastricht criteria, OK? But what, what has happened here, and we've, by the way, seen similar things in NATO. Remember, we took the Greeks and the Turks into NATO at a time when it mattered less whether you were a democracy or not. You know? um, the, the Greeks had a military dictatorship. The Turks had a military dictatorship. Um, today, we would probably say we would not take in a country that is not democratically run. That's one of the problems that we have with Georgia and that we have with Ukraine as well. Similarly, in Europe, we have come to realize that the internal viability and capability of a, country's, of a country's domestic political economy makes it vulnerable in ways that are dangerous to, to its neighbors and to the rest of the EU. Now, this is the lesson of the sovereign debt crisis of 2008 and the years thereafter, that the vulnerability even of a very small economy with a relatively very small GDP is the vulnerability of all. That has become the argument for, and, and what, what many label as, a, as, as austerity reforms, and which, which I and many other Germans would insist are structural reforms designed to make the, the representative institutions function better, 
the social contract to function better and more fairly and more decently and make the political economy as a whole less vulnerable. That's a completely different kind of argument than saving your way out of the crisis, which I think is a really crap way of putting it. And I don't think is a fair way of framing uh, what, what the rest of Europe is trying to suggest here. Oh, let me, Sorry, that was let a long me, answer. But no, I it was, felt a, good, that it was a good answer. <laughs> the hope now is that we can engage you all in uh, a dialogue with um, either of our distinguished professors. Hi, thank you again to the panel. My name is Devin Bergstein, and I'm an intern in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs in the U.S. Department of State this summer. So we've been dealing with these issues a lot, and and and, and a lot of our of the mission of the bureau actually echoes a lot of the eloquent comments made by Dr. Uh, Stelzen Mueller um, that that that, that um, this bureau wants a Europe free, whole, and at peace. Uh, so given that mission, uh, especially you, Dr. Stelzen Mueller, um, do you see um, a significant role for the U.S. in terms of mediating this conflict? Or what specific policy prescriptions would you have in terms of us kind of stepping in as, as, as a non-European no negotiator? Thank you. I don't think that the U.S. Uh, can usefully step in here as a negotiator. Um, I, I don't, you know, I mean, obviously, the, you know, the, the White House and uh, Secretary of the Treasury and the State Department, everybody's been making phone calls, you know, telling everybody to, you know, get a grip. Um, but the, the policy prescription coming from Washington, um, and I've, you know, I've seen uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, talk about this, uh, and you know, where everybody reads the, the op-eds, um, are perceived in, in Europe as, as you know, not particularly helpful because they're seen as not, you know, essentially not working in the European context. And of course, there is a fair amount, I mean, to be blunt here, a, 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 some resentment in, in Europe given that um, there is a, you know, you can make the argument that the, um, that it was the Lehman Brothers um, catastrophe that, you know, you know, got the whole thing rolling and transatlantic contagion, which is not, you know, I mean, I don't take the line uh, which some conspiracy theorists in, in Europe have that, you know, it's all America's fault and, you know, if that hadn't happened, we'd all be in great shape. This is not true because our economies, our, our transatlantic economies, America and, and Europe, are deeply integrated. Something bad happens on one side, it's going to hit us, and this can go the other way, as indeed it has. Um, and the and and also, <laughs> frankly, you know, our own vulnerabilities are our responsibility and something we need to take care of. So if we're vulnerable, that's our problem. Um, so I, I mean, I have to say, I think that Washington occasionally does offer advice that is unhelpful both in style and substance. We've been there. Um, uh, that's not to say, you know, we haven't done the same thing before. You will remember the famously uh, um, uh, unfriendly relationship between Jimmy Carter and Helmut Schmidt. Well, some of you will remember that, not all of you, obviously. But, um, you know, this, this can cut go both ways, too. But I think my, I have to say that on a personal level, and having lived here now for six months and come, come to Washington a lot in the years before that, my sense is that the people who work on these issues in the machine room, as I call it, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, in the federal system, uh, in the White House, the National Security Council, state, DOD, and elsewhere, are extremely knowledgeable about how Europe and, uh, works and how the economies of Europe work, and are, I think, you know, intelligently sympathetic in, in ways that I find quite oppressive. You know. And from what I've seen, more in the sort of, um, admittedly, more in the defense and security context, which is the one that I look at most closely, there is a great deal of practical coordination and a great deal of sort of, you know, uh, circular phone calling all the time. And I think that this is a testament, testimony, to just how, you know, tr trustful transatlantic cooperation has become. Um, and this despite, you know, things like the NSA scandal and other things which really have created a lot of waves, uh, particularly in my country. Um, I, I do think that this is one, re one we need to resolve ourselves, but I think it's, it's, helpful, it's helpful, of course, to remind the Greeks and to remind us that this is not just about economics and it's not just about reforms. It is also about geoeconomics and geopolitics. And, and that we are at a moment where I would argue the European project itself could be said to be in danger. And that is something that America ought to, and I think does care about deeply, because that is a, a source of power and leverage for America as well, in not just in Europe, but in the European periphery 
on issues that it cares about profoundly, from the stability of Israel to Iran to Afghanistan to the relationship with Russia, etc. I would say that uh, the United States are really very much concerned with the situation there because mm -hmm. of our real estate, which is related to the geopolitics Actually, yes. that she mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it will be, no one knows the direction that Syriza will take if we collapse, if we go to the drachma and we start asking for help from China and especially from Russia. This it will be something that the Americans uh, cannot afford to lose. Uh, you have to understand, and you all know, the geography of the place. We are there for thousands of years, and uh, we are not in a very nice neighborhood, and the Americans worry about it. Uh, I don't think they, they have a, a kind of a love with Turkey, uh, which is not uh, explainable to me. Uh, the, and they need us more than any other nation over there. Uh, there is, they, we try to create an important alliance between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. Israel, for some time now, is supporting the Greek uh, case uh, geopolitically. And the, as I said, I think Obama and the Department of Defense worry that something could go wrong on that critical real estate for them, strategically speaking. My question uh, dovetails to what we were just talking about. Should Greece get out of Eurozone? Uh, what kind of security problems that would pose? And that I'm, I'm concerned about Putin, obviously, which goes in America, we do not cover properly this issue. Well, I think I already answered part of that uh, with my previous comment. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the present government is in love with Putin. He's a, a ex KGB agent uh, that uh, they think he's a, a great leader of Russia, and they are wrong also on that. And uh, the majority of the Greeks, of course, not only want to remain in the Euro area, they want to remain in the European Union, of course, which is the most critical issue. We want to remain in NATO, and everything could collapse if something goes wrong. And that's what I said earlier. I think the United States could have played a, a more important role. Uh, Mr. Schäuble said uh, to the Americans when they said uh, to the please help them, uh, meaning the Europeans help the Greeks, I says, uh, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> and he really did say that. And uh, he was almost correct. And the Americans, of course, irrespectively of that they are not in such a great shape uh, the last uh, few years, it could have helped. Uh, I could even have suggested a, a Marshall Plan. As you know, the United States, one of the ways of uh, helping the country the last few years, they printed billions of US dollars. They could do the same uh, without having any problem at all, print, printing dollars and send them to Greece, which will not affect the, the American economy. And uh, they give them a loan, and they said, uh, uh, if you, at some point, 50 years from now, you remember to bring it back, we'll be fine. If you don't, it's okay. <laughs> and then you will see the love for America and Obama rather than the love for Putin. Uh, the, 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 we have a special affection also for Russia because they are orthodox like us. And we have the religion uh, part is important to us. And they help us also through the... Uh, revolution against the Ottoman Empire and etc. We are neighbors, of course, also is important, but we do not know how to play this, even this game of creating friends left and right without creating problems with the friends that we already have. You are next. I'm perhaps slightly less worried about Russia. 
because I think that the, uh, while the Putin government uh, appears to be quite willing to act as a spoiler um, where it can and divide Europe where it can and use that for its own purposes, it does not have the resources, including the capital and the finances, to, shall we say, buy itself into, into Russia. The Chinese do. And the Chinese have shown that they're willing and able to do that across Eastern Europe and in Greece, in fact. Uh, and in fact, it was the Chinese, not the Russians, who were trying to buy the harbor of Piraeus. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would, that's the one I would watch most carefully. But, but again, I'm, I, you know, I think Putin is willing, able, and interested in playing spoiler. But that's a different kind of game than buying your way in. I want to make a, a, f a final point, if I may. I think you and I have both outlined secure, the security challenges. I don't really have to, have to add anything to that. But, um, and it was inspired by your comment about there not being enough, you know, labor migration. Um, you know, there are 300,000 Greeks in, in Germany. Um, and a lot of them by now are second or third generation, and they, ha they have German pa passports. You know, one of the one of the, uh, the the young sort of lights of the the German liberals who have been in a tricky situation recently is is one Yorgo Katsimarkakis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and there are a number of others. I was uh, in, as I said, um, in in Germany until uh, an, an, until a week ago, and this Sunday, a German friend and I were at my house here. Uh, uh, watching uh, a lot of emergency, em emergency sort of d d German TV programming put on uh, about the crisis. And of course, all the networks were interviewing German Greeks. And these people were speaking in perfect German with regional accents from the north to the Rhineland to, the, to Swabia to Bavaria. Yeah? I mean, these people have become a part of the German social fabric. Yeah? They are, I mean, you, you, you have to understand that we, you know, this, the, and, and I keep trying to say this in America, we are integrated in ways culturally, we may not have the same language, but we have been moving across each, each, each other's borders for political, economic, and social reasons for 50 years now. And it, and it shows, you know, and it creates, you know, despite all the differences of opinion that we have, it creates a sense of community that transcends the language and cultural differences. And that does, you know, create a sense of a shared destiny, even if we piss each other off. I probably shouldn't say that on public TV. Maybe you can excise that. But, um, but, but the, you know, the reality is that there is a sense of, of, of commonality there yeah, that is hard to explain to a country where almost everybody speaks English, unless, of course, they speak Spanish. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for our panelists. Please join me in thanking them for giving their time and expertise to us today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.